We finished the last lecture without finishing it, you will remember, and I asked for time at the beginning of Lecture 28 on the Incarnation to finish Lecture 27 on the Covenant of Grace, point 10. Okay, this is an uh, adjunct to that that ought to be mentioned even now, though it's going to come in for constant attention throughout the rest of the course at various points. Number 10, if you are true believers in the covenant of grace, you are the hardest working moralists around Matthew 5, 17 to 20, especially 5, 20. I call this to your attention at this joint because I think you're aware of the fact that we are living in an age of what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Now, even cheap grace is an understatement. Grace isn't cheap. It's free. You understand it properly, it is free. But what he's objecting to by that phrase is what we today call easy believism or technically antinomianism. It grows out of the thinking that if we are saved by what Jesus Christ did, we contribute nothing by our activities. We simply appropriate what Christ provides then, of course, what difference does it make? How we live. Our, if our life were essential to it, if our life actually contributed to grace, if we were liberal enough to think that we could earn divine favor by what we do, we would agree. We had to be up and about it. We had to be fighting sin at every turn and cultivating virtue everywhere and that there would be no hope for us if we weren't really earning our own salvation. But since, as the covenant of grace says, salvation's a gift, it's a covenant of grace, not merit, then what difference? How I live? Now, the answer is there's every difference in the world and that as a matter of fact, if you don't live godly in Christ Jesus, you are not a beneficiary of grace. And living godly in Christ Jesus is the highest conception of moral behavior the world has ever known. So that strictly speaking, when our Lord says in Matthew 5, 20, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He means that unless you are more moral than the moralists, you are not saved by grace. It's so far from saying, since I'm saved by grace, it makes no difference whether I'm moral or not. The exact opposite is the truth. If you are not more moral than the moralists, you are not saved. Now, some people are inclined to think that our Lord, when he uttered those words, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom, that he was talking about the righteousness Christ gives us and not the righteousness which we perform. Now, that's a worthy consideration. And, of course, Christ does give us the righteousness, which is the basis of our acceptance in God, but the Word itself wouldn't determine that. You have to determine it by the context, and I would say the context makes it perfectly clear that Jesus Christ is talking not about imputed righteousness, but righteousness of behavior. When he says, unless your righteousness, he means unless your conduct, unless your behavior unless your practicing righteousness excels the practicing righteousness that's claimed by the scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the reason I say that is that in the passages which follow these particular words and apparently illustrate, give examples of what our Lord means, they have to do with conduct. 
The very first thing he takes up is the sixth commandment. It said by them of old, thou shalt not kill. And whoever does kill is in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. And whoever says raka is in danger of the council. And whoever says you fool is in danger of the hell of fire. Now you see, when he's talking about killing, he's talking about an event in the moral world. He's talking about behavior. He's saying, it's said by the law, you shall not kill. I am saying to you, you can't even be angry. You can't say raka. You can't call someone a detestable fool and be my disciple. Now, you see, most of the moralists of that day and this day aim only at the superficial, obvious, first-level teaching of the commandment. When that rich young ruler was told that commandment and other commandments, he said, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Now, what he went by that was that he never killed anybody. He never had to put a sword through someone's bowel. He had never actually clobbered somebody to death. He had never extinguished a life. See? He thought he kept the law. See? He was a real moralist, and Jesus loved him because he spoke the truth, and outwardly his behavior was admirable. But what Christ is saying in Matthew 5, 20, you've got to go far beyond that if you'd be my disciple. If you really accept me and my grace, which rests not at all on your performance, you contribute nothing to it. You're right about that. But if you believe in me, you believe in my morality, and my commandments utterly excel the commandments of the scribes and Pharisees who think they could save themselves by their superficial understanding of the law, I say you must go beyond their morality even though your salvation rests purely on grace. And this is merely an evidence that you are a believer. But if this evidence is not forthcoming, you can sing amazing grace until you die. You will perish in your sins. See, this is what makes me say Christianity is a religion that only God could have given us. Men couldn't even imagine that. You see, when they get very strict about morality, they almost invariably lapse into legalism and think that they earn God's favor by what they do. And left to themselves, if they ever thought that salvation was a matter of grace, then they would come to that conclusion, it doesn't make any difference what I do. But here's God saying it is a matter of grace, totally of grace. Nothing in your hands you bring, simply to my cross you cling. But if you do really, sincerely trust in the salvation which comes from me and me only, you come to me to do my will, and my will utterly transcends the demands of those who think they're going to save themselves by the law. That's what I meant by that last proposition in the preceding lecture. If you are true believers in the covenant of grace, you are the hardest working moralists around. And if you are not more moral than the moralists, you are not saved by grace. Lecture 22, as the incarnation of the eternal Son of God, lecture 1. Number 1, Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily, Colossians 2.19. You imagine that. I can't. But I can believe it. 3, I can believe it not against reason, but for the best of reasons, for God says it in His Word. God ought to know whether he can do it or not. If I say he can't, I'm the smartest of the Alex. Smarter than God I am. Five, Philip was an apostle after my own stupid mind. Show us the Father, he said to Christ. Christ showed him. This is what he said. He who has seen me 
has seen the Father, Philip. Six, if you or I or anyone else said that, it would be blasphemy. Seven, if I said it, I would be mad. Christ said it, and that proves it. The fullness of the Godhead can dwell bodily. Eight, let me pause for station identification. In the midst of a discussion on incarnation, one realizes how important apologetics is. Go back to lecture six and see why reason must believe Christ when he says anything. Number nine, it makes all the difference in the universe who it is who says anything. Some men's words weigh a ton. Christ's words weigh a universe plus ten. But some are smarter than God. They not only know that the incarnation cannot be, they know what it is, a myth, no less. To think that I once studied at Oxford and did not learn how to be wiser than God, maybe I need a refresher course. What I'm alluding to in that last little bit of sarcasm is that there were some Oxford professors involved in that very iniquitous book, Nine, I'm being one of them. And as I say, when I listened to some very fine lectures at Oxford, I didn't happen to hear anybody who was wiser than God but was willing to learn from God. But there's some people there now who know that God never became incarnate. That whole story on which you rest your redemption is nothing less than a myth that couldn't possibly be as I say, they add insult to injury by not only denying it, but supplying us with an alternative explanation. How silly can you get? You've got to be a PhD to be that stupid. Number one, Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. There it is. That man among men. I'll never forget one time years ago when I was walking alone in Palestine on a Sabbath day, on a Jewish Sabbath day, Saturday. I was alone, and boy, I was walking. <laughs> there were no buses, and you couldn't hire a taxi cab. If you were going to get around Palestine in 1950, you were going, on a Sabbath day, you were going to walk. Israel is not a really religious Jewish community, but there are some hardcore religious zealots of the Judaic persuasion. And though they're small in number, they carry a great deal of weight and play a major role in the Jewish parliament. And at that time, at least, they really had a very tight Saturday. But I can remember as I was walking along there somewhere near Cana, I was all by myself in a rather open field. There was a footpath that I was walking along, but I noticed in no way was there anybody around. There weren't people for miles who could possibly hear me. And as I realized that I was walking where Jesus walked, the incarnate Son of God, I just let it go with one great howl of hallelujah. Just an amazement that I screamed out. I'm walking where the Son of God walked incredible experience and so on. But there was that man. I don't know whether he's any taller than I or shorter than I, heavier than I or lighter than I. We don't know his hairdo or anything like that. Always picture of the beard and the, and the long hair and so on. We don't know what Jesus looked like. We just know he was a human being, that's all. A Jew, a Jewish human being. That's all he was as far as his appearance was. But... That wasn't all he was. This man was God. How can you believe it? Didn't conceive it. How can you believe that book? Of all the millions of books in the world, that book alone is the book of God. That man, that man alone is God. Fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily. You imagine that. I can't, but I can believe it. I could believe it not against reason, but for the best of reasons. 
It's in the book God inspired that we learn that the man who walked by the Sea of Galilee was the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily, and God ought to know whether he can do it or not. If I say he can't, I am surely the smartest of the Alex, smarter than God I am. I'm being sarcastic and ironical to make you aware of the fact that however sarcastic, this is absolutely true, that for people to say God can't become incarnate is to act as if they know better than God what he can do. You have to admit that's not very smart to think you're smarter than God. But if you're going to say things like that, when God says otherwise, you certainly are acting as if you know better than God what God can do. A person's got to be out of his mind to think that way, doesn't he? Number five, I cite Philip to show that even a godly man can lapse at times into downright folly. Philip was an apostle after my own stupid mind. Show us the Father, he says to Christ, when Christ says, I must go to the Father. That was after apparently three years of intimate association with the Son of God that the apostle Philip can ask a kindergarten question. Show us the Father. Christ showed him. He who has seen me has seen the Father, Philip. Don't you understand? The Father and I are one. Our essence is the same. While I have done something that the Father and the Spirit have not done, add a human nature, I haven't subtracted from the divine nature. The Father is never visible and you never see the Holy Spirit. The only member of the Godhead who has ever become incarnate and visible is I, the Son, and you have seen me. You see me and you hear me speaking to you now. Don't you know, Philip, that you've seen the Father, you've seen God, the only way he will ever be visible to created eyes. Number six, if you or I, or anyone else said that, it would be blasphemy. Bronson Alcott once said, you know, Bronson Alcott and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Parker and those people were members of that transcendental movement in New England in the last uh, century. And Alcott on one occasion said, I feel I could say today, as Jesus did, I and the Father are one. Emerson didn't point out his blasphemy because Emerson didn't know it, but he did make the remark, the difference between you and Christ is that Christ got the world to believe it. Yes, Christ got the world to believe it because it happens actually to be true. Seven, if I said it, I would be mad. Christ said it, and that proves it. The fullness of the Godhead can dwell bodily. Number eight is a rather important incidental matter. Let me pause for station identification. In the midst of a discussion on incarnation, one realizes how important apologetics is. Go back to lecture six and see why reason must believe Christ when he says anything at all. See, uh, you, you don't leave these lectures behind, you know. It's one thing about videotapes. You put them away, you're not going to bring them down again, to be sure every time you want to refer to something, but unless it's extremely important. But nevertheless, they ought to be a part of you, and they have a real bearing. And so now, at, right out of the midst of a discussion on incarnation, let me remind you that it's absolutely important for you to remember what we said in, in chapter 6, in lecture uh, 6 there, on proving that the Bible is the Word of God. How I can sit here very confidently and say to you, that that man, Jesus, was no other than the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God, and can say in absolute verity that if you, insane mind, can believe 
that he is God and that the person who has seen him has seen God is very indisputable and absolutely established truth because of the fact he was a miracle worker. He comes on the scene as a man. You don't know you're looking at God when you see that man. He does miracles that only God could enable him to do. And you remember we said those miracles which he indisputably did that the Pharisees, because they were embarrassed by them, committed the unpardonable sin of attributing them to the unholy spirit. These things which he did by the Spirit proved that God was actually with him and established what Locke called the credit of the proposer. We brought all that to bear on the matter of the Bible. The Bible... He proposed the Bible is the Word of God. So since his credit is established by God himself who cannot err and does not deceive people who wish not to be deceived and so on, his credit is established. He says the Bible is the Word of God. If you are an intelligent person in full possession of your rational faculties, you know that's no ordinary book that is the one book in the universe which has been written by Almighty God through the hands of men and so on. Now we're noticing that this Jesus Christ says that He is God. And you know it is true. You realize He was a messenger of God, but you know that this man is no mere messenger of God. He's actually God. He says so. As I say, if I said I was God, or Father Divine said he was God, we've got to be mad, or absolutely the most dreadful kind of deceiver and so on. But when this man says he's God, he has to be God. I'm not appealing to faith now. I'm just asking you to be rational, to be reasonable. If you're going to use your head, forget your heart for the moment. But if you're going to use your head, you're in the presence of of deity. This is an article of faith, yes. You can't be a Christian without believing it. But I'm saying you can't be sane without believing it, with this kind of evidence. You understand what I mean now by a station identification and the fact that these preliminary lectures on apologetics are absolutely essential to the verity of these theological redemptive Items. Number nine, it makes all the difference in the universe who it is who says something. Some men's words weigh a ton. You know, we've said that. Gorbachev says something, Reagan says something, and people of international fame say something. That's very important because they are important people, and many people hang on their words, and whether they believe them or not, they know they're very, very influential. That's, for, that's a simple matter of fact, whether it be for good or evil, as the case may be. And obviously, Christ's words weigh a universe plus. Whatever he says has to be true. God can't be anything other than the way, the truth, and the life. But some are smarter than God. They not only know that the incarnation cannot be they know what it is, a myth, no less. To think that I once studied at Oxford and didn't learn how to be wiser than God, maybe I need a refresher course. Now, let me say in conclusion here, in all fairness, the natural first reaction is, of course, this man isn't God. Who in the world has ever seen God walking around in human flesh? As I say, somebody calls himself Father Divine. Get lost. I, 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 I'm busy with serious thing. I can't be taking time. I don't work with the insane. There are other people. Go to the proper institution. I don't want to waste my time on a thing like that. That's, it's a very sane reaction. As I say, I shrieked when I was all alone on that road by Cana, just because of the almost unbelievability of it that that man who once walked here the way I'm walking here now is God. 
I wouldn't believe it about anybody else. I'd just pity him, but this person you're compelled to believe. But I, here's where I'm sympathetic with the writers of the myth idea, the myth of God incarnate. You would expect in every other case, this is a myth. Somebody is attributing deity because he has overexalted some human being. Some Roman emperors would require divine worship, you know. And many people in the history of the church have claimed a kind of deity and so on. So these writers are to be commended in the sense that they are giving, this is something I, I don't think I've mentioned yet that's rather important to, they're giving the reaction of the first glance or the first philosophy. I'm taking off now on a, a uh, thing that William Ernest Hocking wrote at Harvard years ago. I think it was called The Philosophy of the First Glance. The Philosophy of, of the First Glance. I'm not sure the exact title, but it was something like that. And what he meant by that was that most philosophy of the first glance, that is the first idea you come to when you examine certain data, is wrong. And you've got to take another look. I've often commented on the theology of the first glance, and it is usually wrong. And there, these Oxford, Oxonians who wrote this book, and others as well, and so on, who at first glance think that this has to be a myth, that this man can't be God. That's an understandable thing, but it's the first glance. If they take a second glance, they'll know better. They'll realize, of course, it is possible. You've got to admit that. And here, the evidence is compelling, and it is absolutely certain. And a rational human being is going uh, to recognize it. But what I'm commending them for is a sort of naturalness of the first glance, but a second glance will show that this Jesus Christ is no mere man among men. H.G. Wells, another Briton, once wrote, man among men. That's true. He was a man among men. But what Wells what meant was that's all he was, a man among men. They appealed especially to that statement of our Lord, why do you call me good? None is good. And I must look at that when we come to the second lecture on the Son of Man, whether I have it scheduled here or not. I think I'll put it on the blackboard so I don't forget to deal with that point here, which is often made as a very emphatic argument that Christ is not God because Christ himself denies his own deity, saying, why do you call me uh, God? That was a basis, at least, for Wells's statement, man among men, why call me, why do you call me God? And we'll face that, as I say, in the next lecture, but here I'm observing that Wells was noticing that Jesus Christ was a true man, and he was utterly right about that. And the title of his essay, Man Among Men, impeccable, nothing wrong. Jesus was a man among men. But when he meant by that, merely a man among men, not God among men, but man among men, then he made, of course, the fatal mistake.